is ArtSense, a podcast focused on educating and informing listeners about the past, present, and future of art. I'm Craig Gould. On today's episode, I speak with artist John Gerard. The Irish-born artist has spent more than 20 years using the latest in technology to create virtual worlds. Unlike video art, Gerard's work is generated from a handwritten computer program while viewing and No two viewing experiences are ever the same. The content of his work typically asks the viewer to deeply consider the attributes and consequences of the environment they are viewing. And now, a discussion about the generation of virtual worlds with John Gerard. So John Gerard, thank you for joining me this week on the Art Sense podcast. John, I usually like to start conversations with the artists with a hypothetical, which is if you were at a dinner party seated next to somebody who has no idea who you are or what you do, how do you describe that to them? Uh, that's a good place to start because that actually happens quite frequently. Um, so I would typically say just to try and sort of couch it um, in, in something that people might might understand, I typically say that as an artist, I make virtual worlds. Um, and then, you know, the inevitable next question is, you know, do I make do I make games? You know, do I make sort of virtual games? And I say no, like they're more kind of like they're sort of more static, kind of let's say like um yeah, the specific scenes which I find interesting or you know, sort of, you know, sort of uh, important. And you know, I typically build a portrait of that scene within the virtual. And then present it you know, in the world as an as an artwork. So, uh, but uh, often you know I'll go through all of that, and then um, you know people still have no idea what a Pokemon is. To be frank, so um, one thing I I try and really uh, communicate to people is that you know I'm not making films. You know that these are not worlds that are you know like tied to a timeline. You know there's no specific narrative. You know, it's a kind of world making in a sense like you know it's a little bit sculptural on the one hand and on the other hand it's, it's also kind of painterly because they're sort of scenes you know uh but nonetheless it's a fairly difficult thing to communicate we may spend have the program just kind of trying to define what your work is and isn't right it's not static it's not video but there's a moving visual element to your work but mm. it isn't tied to the timeline that we typically think of in mm. terms of film, correct? Yeah. I mean, the, really, the, the, the kind of the, the platform that I'm jumping from is, is called the game engine, basically. And really, um, the game engine is best understood or described as like a virtual world. And the engine controls the camera in that world. So... You know, the camera is in the world recording what's happening within that virtual world. And by that, I mean, in real time, it's calculating lighting, shadowing, dynamics like smoke or you know, these kinds of things. And it's sending um, those that stream of images out to a display device, be it a screen, be it an LED, be it a uh, projector. And, uh, you know, what's interesting for me is that, you know, that stream, yeah, at you know, with a good graphics card and a, and a you know good engine, you can get 60, 80, 100 frames per second coming out of the engine. And each of those uh, frames are, are displayed for, you know, a fraction of a second for the public, and then they're discarded, basically. So really the cultural artifact of what I'm producing is um, like a piece of software, like, like code. Um, on the one hand, and on the other hand, you know, potentially it's just like people's memory of the, these moments in time. You know, those are the, that, that's the, the kind of pivot of the presentation in a way. Because at the end of the presentation, you know, there is no real, there's no real thing. There's a set of instructions to produce um, uh, an image which, you know, has the presence, you know, the, 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 has a world-like quality, I would say. That's really interesting because, I mean, that creates a real ephemeral nature to your work in that as things are being created, things are being dumped. Mm. Can I assume that if I were to walk into one of your installations, say I were to take an image Mm. uh, of a work, you know, at some point in time and in its Mm. generation, 
can I assume that I will never exactly see that same moment again or like no two moments are the same over the course of the installation? Like in effect, uh, a little bit depends on the piece, but um, you know, these are like, I, I don't necessarily have to do this, but I place the worlds that I make into an annual, um, let's say, orbit of light. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sun rises on, on my, my world, you know, specific to where the, the piece is located, not, not where it's been exhibited, but let's say it's a portrait of the ocean uh, near Tonga. You know, mm -hmm. The sun will rise on that scene um, on Tongan time. Uh, you know, and it'll rise at, in a certain position in June, a different position in January, travel over the sky. So, I mean, it's quite minimal, but, you know, obviously the sun will be in a different position each day unless you're there at the same time next year. So that's like the first layer of kind of difference, you know. So these are annual solar sins. Um, in the case of, let's say, a flag work, um, such as a piece called Flare, which was just mm -hmm. at pace over the summer, um, you know, that piece centers on uh, like a burn simulation, like a fuel burn simulation, which is, um, you know, which, which just unfolds. I mean, it's largely like it does parameters within which it unfolds. So, you know, it has a recognizable quality across its, its cycles. But it, it it's not it doesn't really it's not a it's not a loop like it doesn't repeat itself like it's it's a sort of simulation of of the burning of a kind of dirty gas in a way. Um, so each time you see it, the sun will probably be in a different position, a slightly different burn. The waves will be slightly different condition. But um, you know, that's not the, the point of the work. But it's it, it what you've said is is true. It's unlikely. It's actually impossible. You'll see the same scene twice. That exhibit in Lings uh, at Pace over the summer, I was in New York. I was on a panel at NFT NYC, and uh, made it, I made it down to Chelsea. When I got to uh, got to Pace Gallery, it was actually closed and installing uh, your work. And so mm -hmm. through through the window, I could see them installing Flare, and I was so kind of taken back by the scale of it that you mm. know I was taking video through the the window. Can you tell us a little bit more about Inlings and um, mm. that that was a that's an exhibit that was at Pace over the summer that that was mm. comprised by three works, right? Yeah. Yeah, so um so I suppose first of all um Pace has has two spaces on on West 25th. Mm -hmm. Um one is uh the new sort of tower, let's say, of, of kind of multiple galleries, and the historic uh, Pace Gallery, which is at 510, 508, 510, just, just under the High Line, which is like a really very substantial mm -hmm. lateral gallery stretching back, stretching to the side, actually goes under the High Line, uh, with these amazing glass doors which open onto the street. Uh, you know, on cooler days, you could open it onto the street. Um, so Endling, the work that you're, the show that you're describing, uh, opened there um, in June 2022. And, you know, I, I, I'm not exactly sure how big the space is, but it's, it's about like a thousand square meters. You know, like it's a really big. It's enormous. And they've, they, they spent a huge sum of money to make that an open space with, yeah. with no pillars. I mean, it's, it's, yes. it's massive. Yeah. So uh, that, that would have happened a while ago. But, um, and, you know, it's also got these incredible histories. I mean, um, you know, Robert Irwin did the most beautiful uh, Perspex um, pillar show there. You know, Smithson did this amazing, you know, sort of sculptural, you know, minimal sculptural shows there. So there's all these kind of histories there. Terrell, all these incredible artists. So um, my show centered on three works, as you, as you mentioned. Uh, the first, uh, when you came in, was uh, an 18 foot by an 18 foot LED from this incredible company called Row Visual that actually supported the installation. And uh, so it's a big, big LED that's the size of like a two story building, basically. And on it is a work called Flare, which is... Um, uh, a flag which is constructed out of, um, let's say it's like a gas flare, sort of an alarm on the one hand uh, and a sort of, uh, and a kind of a flag on the other. 
located in the sea near a portrait of the sea near near Tonga. Uh, behind that, uh, at the back of the gallery, behind the wall, the big LED wall, you have another smaller LED wall, which is about two meters by two meters, mounted on the wall, and that was showing a piece called Washington Dot Stream, that uh, response to the 405 in LA. Uh, on Thanksgiving evening, where you've got like these two streams of traffic, headlights making one stream, taillights making the other, one red, one white, replicated uh, to become a kind of 30,000 car uh, traffic simulation. And in that piece, there's this sort of performance of a flag, you know, this kind of flag like mm -hmm. performance. Um, again, set on LA time uh, with the camera orbiting around. So you kind of lose the flag qualities at a certain point and it comes back around. And the whole show um, was titled by the last work, which was in the side gallery, which is a portrait of the very last of the American passenger pigeons. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's funny, I was overhearing somebody in the gallery uh, in July when I was there. Somebody was doing a tour and they were talking about like carrier pigeons. Like mm -hmm. carrier pigeons are different than passenger pigeons. Carrier pigeons like <laughs> bring carry messengers around. Right. Passenger pigeons um, were never really uh, tamed as such. They, they were these extraordinary community, uh, like population of wild American pigeons, passenger pigeons. Between eight to 10 billion of them lived, uh, you know, traveling down the East Coast of America, mostly feeding from the woods, like nuts from the woods. Mm -hmm. It's called mast. Um, you know, around about, let's say, 1800, you know, maybe you know, between eight to 10 billion of those birds. And in 1900, you had one. So wow. it's this kind of absolutely incredible population collapse, one known example. And that known example was a bird called Martha, who's christened Martha, who lived out her last days in Cincinnati Zoo. And so she died in 1914 as kind of a celebrity, like the last of the passenger pigeons. Nobody could ever imagine that the passenger pigeons would become extinct because there were so many of them. And there's lots of reasons why they became extinct, but mostly to do with uh, excessive uh, you know, human consumption of them and also disruption of their nesting sites and these sort of things. So the final piece is a kind of melancholy, small simulation showed on an LCD, which was called Endling, which is a monochromatic black and white portrait of Martha in her cage. Uh, and we built that portrait around uh, photographs from Cincinnati Zoo on the one hand, but also documentation of um, the taxidermied body of Martha, which is in the Smithsonian in Washington, basically. So... And mostly what she does is she kind of keeps an eye on you as, a, as an endling. You know, she keeps an eye on you, kind of the contemporary public. So I've, I've heard you describe your work as being anxious objects that shift people. Can you maybe give a little bit more insight as to what, what's behind that description? Well, I was probably feeling a little bit overconfident that day. They're, <laughs> anxious ob they're anxious objects, for sure, in a way are unfamiliar objects in a way. Um, and, you know, they, their ambition is to, is to, I suppose, move people, you know, to kind of move the public in different sorts of ways. Um, and I guess, like, within the specific language that's developed, you know, within the work, um, you know, the worlds are, they are very realistic, but, but they, they're also fundamentally virtual, you know. And that is often like a start point in, you know, a public relationship with the work, you know, which is that, you know, it's, it's recognizably real, but there's something that's a little bit the matter, something slightly kind of wrong and people mm -hmm. don't entirely know exactly where so or what. So that's a sort of slightly uncomfortable, maybe anxious place to begin, you know, which is like, what, what is it that I'm addressing? Um, and also, like it doesn't have many of those game qualities of kind of like certain kinds of resolution, certain types of pace, certain types of, let's even aesthetics, you know, it doesn't have that. It has another sort of aesthetic. Um, and then I suppose the subject of the work, um, you know, as I described, Endling, Flair, you know, they sort of respond to, I would describe it, you know, as contemporary conditions, you know, which are like increasingly anxious, you know, where, you know, flair is recontextualized by Russia switching off natural gas to mm -hmm. flowing to Europe yesterday, mm -hmm. you know, with no, uh, with no um, schedule around, you know, it, um, it's starting again. So, 
uh, you know, th th these are sort of anxious times. And I think in a sense, like I've always been interested in these places where, you know, power intersects with energy. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, power means, you know, both like energy on the one hand, and it also, you know, has a connotation of, of like force and politics and such right. things. Um, so like that pivot of kind of, you know, simulation, power, energy, I suppose politics, you know, the work is, is is relatively political you know so um yeah those are sort of stark points sure and then again like the hope is that the public will come to them and you know, the greatest ambition of any artist is to move the public you know sure uh, as opposed to just being ignored which is also possible no i i find it really interesting that you're able to get to these places where just the the words that we assign the the work is able to exist at so many uh, levels, right? So like uh, the inling piece, the flare, there's a, a term in natural gas or in gas production where you're burning off excess and that that's called flaring. But, you know, mm, we sure. think, and when we think of uh, if you're out in the ocean, like this flag that in, in mm. the Tongan Ocean is, if you were to send mm. up a distress signal, that would oh, yeah. also be a flare, right? Yeah, that 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 actually that that dual meaning to the word flare is absolutely center of that piece. You know, I mean, rewinding a tiny little bit, uh, I have another work uh, called Western Flag, uh, which is a portrait of uh, the site of the very big first big oil strike uh, in world history, which happened in Spindletop in Texas in 1901, where it was like the first like mega strike, let's say, the birth of right. big oil. Uh, a place called Spindletop. And I showed the resulting work, which is a, a, a portrait of that site augmented by kind of almost like a carbon flag, like a smoke mm -hmm. flag. I showed it in Madrid um, late 19, 2019. And I was approached by an artist and activist from Tonga called Uli Lusi. And he said to me, um, you know, he, he, he sort of acknowledged that it's interesting to speak about the histories of oil exploitation, you know, which is what that piece addresses. And also what's called the carbon legacy, which is how CO2 from those early strikes are, are still in the atmosphere, which is sort of, you know, sort of fascinating and not very well known. But what he specifically said to me at that time was that the, you know, as a Tongan, as an artist, as a swimmer, as a, you know, uh, as a sort of uh, activist, he said he just wanted to announce to like the public in Madrid that the ocean is on fire. Uh, and he said that to me there in, mm -hmm. in, in Madrid at the climate change conference in Madrid in, in late 19. And um, you know, I was just really struck by this idea that the that the you know, for him, the, what he means by that is that the ocean is getting hot, you know, mm -hmm. and by beyond fire, he means that like just it's. You know, you have these, you have these, um, like the equivalent to kind of wildfires, like, mm -hmm. you know, passing across, you know, heat waves passing through the ocean, let's say in Tonga, and they leave behind kind of marine deserts, you know, they kind of kill off all the corals and such things. Um, and so I went away and kind of thought about this idea, you know, a piece of language, you know, which is that the ocean is on fire. And in time, you know, developed a response, which was this idea of the flare, you know, the alarm you know, the language of flames. And also, you know, I mean, really, Uli's appeal was also for the, for, for the viability of Tonga, you know, as a nation state, you know, that was, was is Tonga going to survive these disasters and catastrophes that keep kind of like um, assaulting it, you know, particularly climate related. So, you know, the flare is, is both, as you, as you said, like an alarm, but it is also a national flag, which is kind of in a way self-combusting or, you know, it's not on fire, like it actually is fire. You know, it, it, that's the material it's built, you know, it's built from flame. So can you talk about the role of time in your work? You spoke about the, the orbits. You know, there are several things going on. A lot of times the virtual camera moves through your work at the mm. pace that someone walks Hmm. light changes according to where the object is in the natural hmm. world. Hmm. But then you have other works where, you know, for example, the 3,000 year sunrise, right? I mean, how do you uh, deal with time in your well, work? It's funny, I was kind of mentioned. So actually that is, it's a piece called Thousand Year Dawn. So it's, it's a, a thousand years, not 3,000 years. I'm sorry. Uh, no, no problem, no problem. Um, 
And that's really the one of the very, very first works. That's from 05, 2005. And, um, you know, when I moved out of, let's say, like 3D scanning in like the mid to late 90s, you know, I was, I was not moved out of, but I was sort of, I was scanning things in like the mid 90s. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of saying to myself, you know, here is a kind of a photographic type record of the world, but it's a kind of three-dimensional record. You know, it's a photo type record. And I, at that time, I called them image objects. You know, they're kind of images and objects simultaneously, which is really what they are, actually. Like a, like a, a digital 3D scan is like an image object. Um, it's a photographic type thing that you can turn. Um, and, you know, as as the 90s came to a close, um, you know, people started talking to me about game engines. You know, why don't you bring these things into game engines? I was like, you know, I came from an art school background. And art schools, you know, were very disconnected from computing at that time. I mean, they still kind of are, but like even more so then, you know. So the moment I got into the engine with this scan, this head actually, it just became very clear to me that like your know, time, the, let's say the temporal aspect of the space was a sort of sculptural component of it. You know, you could work with time in these absolutely new, un, uh, you know, there was no precedent to it, you know. And so one of the very first pieces, uh, which was not a scan because, you know, the engines at that time, the graphics at that time, they just couldn't really deal with the sort of resolutions coming from, from scanning. Is a piece called Thousand Year Dawn where you have a beach, virtual beach, a virtual sea, a virtual sun. Uh, a young man is standing, a portrait of somebody I knew at that time called Marcel is standing on the beach and he's watching the sun rise in the piece, basically. So the sun is rising. Everything else is running at, at the normal tempo, like the waves are moving up the beach and he's breathing and shifting his position. But the sun is rising in that work um, very, very, very slowly. So it's rising so that it'll break free of the horizon uh, in 3005. So it's like a thousand year dawn. And we program the work, you know, in the unlikely situation that it actually gets to that point so that he would leave the scene in 3005 and you would end up just with the dawn, basically, that that would be the work. And so we presented that actually in Miami um, at an art fair in 2005. And it was the first work I ever sold. You know, people came in, collectors came in and bought it. And um, it just was this kind of radical shift in how I could work, you know. And, and just to be clear, you know, it was presented uh, as, a, you know, as a piece of software mm -hmm. on a computer in an artist frame. But really the collectors were, were acquiring software, art software, in addition of, I think, five. And then, um, you know, over time, a lot of those collectors have had to come back, like, you know, 2005, what's that, like 17 years ago. And, you know, they've had to upgrade elements of the installation, you know. So, but it's really the software that is the kind of core thing that they acquire. But um, just to get back to where we started, so that was an early work which, which really addressed this idea of time uh, as a sculptural element of, of the virtual. Um, and, you know, a little later, I made a piece called um, Oil Stick Work, where, where there's a kind of piece of work that's accumulating in the scene over 30 years. But I've really not really dealt with, with this idea of time so explicitly since, that, since then, since 05. But we're currently developing an NFT project, um, like a spatial NFT, um, temporal NFT project, where we, we kind of get back to the, that idea of duration and, and, and accumulation. So that's, what's, that's what we're working on now. So is that a piece that would be more generative, where things uh, are manifested over time, that they, they evolve and change? And Yeah. Well, I mean, it's still in the development stage, but there's a character in the work um that's arranging objects in these kind of unique ways over time like like three-dimensional objects like let's say bones you mm -hmm. know kind of arranging bones 
in different sorts of ways. Um, and it's a kind of like a, like a, like a human like character in a way, like not quite, quite a human character. So each iteration of this piece, um, you have this kind of different sort of unfolding work within it over time. And I must say um, that category of like NFTs and world making is very, very underdeveloped right now. You know, it's, 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 um, it, it intersects with what's called WebGL, like web mm -hmm. graphics language. Uh, and my piece, which I did for Artblocks, um, which is called Petro National, which opened around simultaneously to, to actually NFT Art Week in New York and my show in New York. It opened just a few days before. They're actually temporal NFTs, like they're annual work. So the sun comes up and goes down in those over a year. But that didn't really register with people. I mean, they mostly, it mostly what registered is that like each work is a portrait of a country realized at the gasoline spill. And, you know, some of the more basic aspects of those works kind of registered, but but that temporal aspect uh, didn't. So that, that there's more work to be done there, sure. which is interesting. So the game engine versus WebGL, uh, how much power is in the WebGL? Like, can you do the things in WebGL that you were able to do, you know, 15 years ago, but kind of self-contained in an NFT? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I mean, I cannot do the kind of things I'm doing in contemporary engines hooked up to kind of super graphics cards now. You know, I can't do some of those things. You know, particularly, let's say, the multi-actor works. Mm -hmm you know, where you've got like 10,000 elements within the world, you know, that kind of stuff. You know, that's, that's not going to happen. But, you know, what's interesting uh, is that I didn't really have a mechanism, you know, because like if historically, if I was going to make a, a virtual world, like a simulation, like it's quite a big undertaking. And you, we, we have, a, have an amazing producer here, Werner Pretzelberger, an incredible programmer who I worked with for many years, Hamid Bressler. But also typically you'd work with a group of modelers, group animators, you know, et cetera, you know. So they become quite big productions, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, and then, you know, they move into the world, let's say, by a geographic system. You know, let's say a gallery brings one, you know, to, to a show in their gallery or potentially to an art fair, you know, in Switzerland or something. But that's all kind of like quite a heavy structure in a way. And what's uh, incredibly rich and, and sort of um, exciting about the NFT infrastructure is that you know, it's non-geographic. You know, your collectors are global, mm -hmm. your exhibition space is online. And so we're like lightening up, you know, like we're like making a couple of works right now within the NFT space, which are um, almost like drawings. You know, I never really could do that, you know, mm -hmm. because like, how would you bring like a drawing type sim into this very heavy geographic gallery world you know like you can put a drawing on the world on the wall you know mm -hmm. but um but i don't really do that you know I've, I've always been like very very digitally kind of native like right back to when i kicked off in art school in the as i said in the mid 90s so yeah so just to try and answer your question a bit more clearly um I could make Thousand Year Dawn in WebGL now, no problem. Absolutely, yeah. Um, but we're going to try and push that a little bit, you know. Um, I would say uh, it'll probably be best viewed on a, on, a, on a laptop, you know, like less so than on, a, let's say, a handheld. It'll probably be seen on a handheld, but the frame rate might be a little bit under pressure. Um, but yeah, I mean, we can, from for what we were doing in 05, we can do effortlessly. In web, well, we can, we can not effortlessly, but we can absolutely deliver that into WebGL. And that's, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, like this is the most exciting part of NFTs right now, you know, post MP4, post JPEG, to a degree, almost like radically cranking open that generative space, you know, sure. as opposed to the generative, like on-chain script delivering like a two-dimensional output you know generative on-chain delivering like three-dimensional spatial temporal world i have a question that applies to both i guess the nft space and 
in the the gallery site specific work and that is navigation Mm. in this nft work are you allowing the viewer a sense of autonomy to navigate Mm. around this object and i know that traditionally in your work there's sort of a a set path right i mean things will change but that virtual camera is kind of pretty fixed yeah well i mean it's funny you say that because thousand year dawn when it was exhibited was on a shelf with a, a laptop in the shelf, a little turn sensor, and a pivot, and you could look around the world by turning the screen. Oh, that, wow. That's how it was first presented. So the original works, you, the public could look around the world. And for those who were kind of raised on cinema, let's say, like that was like, you know, I remember people like being totally shocked that <laughs> they're, you know, they could physically look around something. And that's obviously changed over time. But, you know, pertinent to what you've just said, you know, over time, you know, we dropped that interactivity, they became virtual scenes with this very formal camera that walks around the work. Um, You know, you've got an orbit of a camera at walking speed, as you've described, uh, set in a light orbit of a year, and then often other kind of orbits, you know, be it the burn cycle and these kinds of things, which are embedded. And, you know, I suppose it on, on a podcast like this, it's worthwhile pointing out that like an orbit is, you know, a self-similar cycle, but upon which different things can happen. Mm -hmm. And a loop is, um, you know, where the same thing happens over and over and over again. So, Mm -hmm. you know, the the, the world of real time and the virtual is is very orbital. You know, it's very, it's suited to orbital languages. The world of cinema and video is is suited to, to kind of loop type languages. And they're really different, you know. And I hit that absolutely head on with a piece, a very early NFT of mine called Western Flag NFT, which was, mm-hmm. had to be a 30 second loop, you know, which was like first time I had worked in any kind of video language in like 25 years, you know, so it was a bit of a shock to the system. But in terms of interactivity, um, you know, if you look at Petro National on Artblocks, um, which is a collaboration between Artblocks and, and Pace Gallery, um, if you either with your finger or with your mouse, if you click on on the each of those 196 NFTs, you can look around the world, you know, within a fairly set orbit, um, and you can tip it a little bit to look around it in different sorts of ways. So interactivity has come right back in with the emergence of the spatial temporal NFT, you know, because I've, I've always been interested that the public would understand that this is a kind of three dimensional world, that it's not like a two dimensional. Uh, surface, you know, that you can pivot around it. What do you consider the finished work? I mean, is it the code or is it the installation of the work? Mm. Do do the pieces that are more site specific change that answer? I've heard you speak about how some of the pieces, it's very specific how it's installed and how it's mm. perceived because it's almost creating, I don't, yeah. don't want to say a virtual experience, but you're, it's, you're creating like a synthetic live mm. experience within a yeah. within a space, right? Yeah. Well, okay. So a couple of kind of layers to that question. I mean, first of all, the work is the executed code. You know, like let's say the cultural artifact, like if a museum was to acquire the work, they would acquire the software, which is a kind of like a packaged bundle of different types of, you know, different types of, you know, libraries and code and such things. But the work is is the executed code, you know, so it's sort of like if, if the machine's not in the mix, if the computer's not in the mix, you really don't have the work, you know. So the, the piece is kind of in that like kind of weirdly robust, but also quite sort of um, vulnerable in a weird way. Um, so that said, um, the works are typically very site-specific um, you know, within the context of where and how they are executed. So, um, and this makes my life kind of really, you know, pretty challenging ongoing. Um, You know, for instance, like the show and pace, uh, each element was scaled to its site, you know. So I, I come from a sculptural background, you know, I also come from a background where, you know, I've paid very, very close attention to artists like I said, Robert Irwin or you know, James Terrell or such people, mm-hmm. or even Ronnie Horn would be another big influence for right. me, even 
artists like Felix Gonzalez Torres was a very, very big influence on me when I was kind of coming up as an artist. So I would look at the negative space like around these proposed interventions and that would be kind of very key, you know, that sort of negative space. Right. Uh, then like how the installation is resolved, you know, like uh, how the LED wall sits in the world, you know, what sits underneath it, how it's supported. They're always frameless. You know, you have the real and the virtual up against each other. Um, and, you know, I, you know, the very earliest installations along these lines um, really kicked off as I described, like, let's say around 05, you know, so we're sort of like 17, 18 years into this language of kind of very formal installations of simulations in physical space. And also now increasingly on the street, you know, you know with LEDs, but again, paying a lot of attention to the negative space around the works. Mm-hmm. Uh, but like really each installation is, is deeply site-specific. And by that, I mean, um, you know, LEDs are um, incredibly luminous, you know, like they're light emitting diodes. And, um, you know, you, you, it's almost as if like if, if, you're, if you're trying to set up like a sound installation, it has to be tuned to the setting, you know, mm-hmm. Z- very similar to LEDs, you know, like it has to actually be dialed to the setting so that like you look at the floors and the walls and all those things. Um, also, like these are annual simulations, so the sun goes down, it gets dark. You know, what does that mean for the work? You know, like I, part of me kind of wonders, like, how do you communicate all this stuff? You know, like to to institutions, you know, and how do you kind of try and um, try and get the work kind of installed in an exemplary kind of fashion into the future? So it's pretty, pretty, pretty difficult actually. You know, uh, but you know. Again, you know, my, my undergraduate, you know, I come from a really like a sculptural background, you know, and another artist who's been incredibly influential on me would be the artist, French artist Pierre Huy. Mm-hmm. And, you know, his, his version of sort of site specificity is even more expanded than mine because like he has all these layers, um, uh, you know, which he's paid a lot of attention to, to do with kind of like, like what's growing there. And, you know, he's mm-hmm. kind of quite often working out in the landscape. I don't know. Yeah. So I feel like as these LEDs have, um, you know, this is a capability that wasn't there for you 15, 20 years ago. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and as the, the capability is now there to actually create and install basically a digital monolith in uh, a landscape that an artist may want to capture just for the sense of sublime as a landscape photographer or painter, mm-hmm. putting this digital monolith there mm. in conversation with its surroundings mm. it seems like it really creates a whole other world that oh, that's yeah. also changing in which you know you mentioned james terrell earlier you know like mm. you know as as the light starts changing on some mm. of these environments oh, yeah. in the at the same time that your work is changing you know in its orbit in its light mm. there's this serendipity that kind of occurs right i mean there's a little magic there right um, have you ever seen, uh, I was part of, there's, there's a beautiful project in California called Desert X. I saw images of that. That's Which is out uh, like in, in the desert uh, near Palm Springs. It's like a, it's like a Biennale. And I'm just going to quickly share, can I share my screen here? Yeah. I know it's a podcast, but I can share my screen quickly right. one second. So basically that is an LED in the desert um, near Palm Springs. And, um, and, you know, exactly as you have said, uh, you know, this, this is a world in a world, you know, right. let me just, I'm just trying to find one other. What's really interesting about the image that you just showed is that it, it really feels like the sky in, I, and I know it's, I know it's a photograph, but it really seems like the sky in your image, in your work is at a point where it's matching the sky above of, of that mountain well, line. Well, you know, the funny thing is they're not that far away from each other, you know. And, and it's almost like it's cut cut a hole in reality, right? Well, that's what that's a word that I often use. I mean, that, that image that I'm now sharing, you know, which is like a little bit later in the day, um, you know, like when I, I'm trying to describe to institutions what I'm trying to do, 
um, you know, I often use the word I'm trying to cut a hole in the reel mm -hmm. and to produce this sense of an overlay or underlay, which is underneath. And, um, you know, and that's why the, that's why the works are frameless, like the LEDs are frameless. And that's why, you know, in this setting, in the Desert X, <laughs> like I had to like literally defend the bushes, you know, because, right. you know, the guys who are um, installing this, um, you know, they're like concert guys, you mm -hmm. know, they're like, uh, you know, they're rock concert guys. So it's kind of in out, like there's a certain kind of, you know, sort of energy to them, a certain speed to them. And I'm sort of begging them not to step on these, you know, little bushes because like what you want is that like, it feels like an undisturbed desert scene. And then there's this sort of uncanny virtual um, scene. And, and really like this installation was quite amazing for me because we're outside we're outside palm springs like we're off the highway to la mm -hmm. you know and um you have this audience like driving you know between palm springs and la and it's 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 a very it's a it's a very diverse audience you've got like rich people which are kind of expected but you've also got like people who are working in restaurants you know people who are you know what i mean people on the road that kind of thing and a lot of them would just pull off the highway and come out to them. And they were just like, what is this? You know? And on the one hand, you can just say, you know, this is like you take a little section of Times Square and kind of pull it down, put it on the landscape, you know, which helps them understand what it is. Because they, they didn't really understand, like, in a sense, like, it feels a bit like an apparition, you know, when you come right. across these things, you know, because it's kind of like an image with no context or no frame. And then I suppose the next layer, and one of the things that made this installation very successful was the next layer is that like the flag is both familiar and also deeply unfamiliar mm -hmm. because it's produced from this, um, this intangible thing like smoke, which normally doesn't really behave like that, you know? And, you know, one, one beautiful aspect about working within simulation is that you can work with intangible things like flames and smoke, again, in a very sculptural way, you know? And that's a whole process of trial and error, you know, to make, for us to make like a flag, which is smoke-like and flag-like was, you know, it was about three or four months of experimentation, you know, and it, 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 we didn't get to that place very smoothly, you know. Um, we had to do a lot of in, invention to make that, that piece work. So, and so for the public, like on that basis, they haven't, they don't really recognize this thing. So it's kind of a couple of layers of kind of discomfort and, and sort of fascination, which I would suppose is, is, the, is the, the aspect about working in the public domain that um, is, is the most motivating for me, you know, that like you get diverse audiences and they come to the work from this place of, in a way, kind of confusion and, you know, it's interesting. I don't mean to shift gears too much here, but, you know, I want to be sensitive uh, of your time out there. And I did want to ask you about, you know, your, your work just continues to evolve, right? In terms of, in that's just the nature of, of working in a medium that's so closely tied to technology. And so, you know, can you tell me about, I know that you have interest in AI and neural networks. And mm. can you talk about the impact, the emergence of that technology is having mm. on your work? Well, yeah, it's funny, actually. Uh, in a weird way, I almost disagree with you a little bit. Because okay. Because... Um, you know, we, you know, when I say we, I mean, sort of myself as an artist in dialogue with collaborators and producers, you know, over, over many years, you know, we've, um, kind of stuck to this very specific language of, let's say world making, um, you know, there's often like a subject, um, you know, the camera orbits it's set in a year. That's been kind of a consistent language for, you know, nearly 20 years. Um, and that's in the face of kind of just incredible developments within, mm -hmm. let's say, game, game technology, graphic card technology, computer powers. You know, I'd say if anything, the work has become more polished and realistic over right. time. You know, that's one of the big, big shifts in, in the language. But, you know, there's been kind of opportunities to kind of, let's say, blast out in different directions, which we haven't taken. Right. Um, that said, um, and funny enough, getting back to the whole kind of lightning space and Californian thing, um, I was invited by uh, Los Angeles County Museum of Art to, um, to 
take part in their um, like their art and tech program, mm-hmm. which was revived by Michael Govan some years ago. And as part of that art and tech program, like as in the original art and tech program in the 60s, you're introduced to key tech players in California, one of whom, of course, is Google. And Google um, had been working on TensorFlow, which was their big kind of public facing uh, neural network. And so we were given particular kind of access to that. And I used that, that, that neural network within a, a kind of experimental work in which a, a leaf covered figure um, is, is trained, given a kind of training set and, and produces a kind of perpetually unfolding dance. Um, but in a weird way, like, you know, if you're working at, at that time, if you're working like I was kind of like pushing against the core nature of, of AI where like the training set, the scale of the training set is key, you mm-hmm. know? So I was producing very small training sets using motion capture and dancers. And, and then I was expecting like the resulting work to have like the kind of complexity that the rest of the work had. So, um, so I a little bit stepped back from um, working with AI at that time. But, um, you know, very, very interestingly, you know, Mid Journey, Dali, you know, they've all emerged since then. I mean, that was probably four or five years ago. Right. And so AI, in terms of its manifestation in the public consciousness, it's now been driven by this very specific kind of like text based AI output interfaces, right. you know, where you say like, you know, clown you know, eating a carrot in the style of, you know, Dega. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know, this diffusion <laughs> up comes this thing. And like, it's like, like, wow, what is going on? You know? And, you know, I see illustrators and photographers and everybody's like, Oh my Lord, you know, what are we going to do with this? How are we going to, you know, very, very close. I think to, you know, painters looking at the emergence of photography, right. you know, and sort of like, you know, like, let's say, 19th century, you know, uh, what are we going to do with this? Like, does this free us up? Does this, you know, does this exclude us? You know, there's a lot of people kind of, you know, I applied to be a a early user of DALI and I'm sort of sitting there going, you know, this is interesting. And how is this going to move? How is this going to influence, let's say, 3D? You know, because Mm -hmm. again, when I was with Art and Tech in LACMA, I was sitting with NVIDIA. They were using... AI to uh, streamline real-time production, you know, because like real-time production is like, like it's so laborious. I mean, animation, right. you know, modeling, you know, like how long before we have a text prompt, like, you know, and you get a 3D model, you know, mm-hmm. or a text prompt and you get a, an animation, you know, like, you know, dancer in the style of a robot, you know, and then the integration of all that, you know, um so yeah so like my my kind of collision with ai was a couple of years ago through through lacma and it's sort of you know i've got places with it but like i'm just this tiny player in in, in the in the in the kind of scale of those kind of like i keep coming back to the idea of the training set but like that's a huge thing um and now like you know the whole space you know open ai and you know sort of it's just kind of shifting like quicksand you know Sure. Um, so I, I think we will, we'll see, next couple of years are going to be wild, I think, in that space. On your horizon, what excites you? Where do you think your work is going? Is, are you excited more by the, the possibility of what NFTs are able to offer? Or is there something with technology that is emerging and evolving that is making you rethink mm. you know, the site-specific yeah. work? So. Um, I would say that, you know, I'm most excited to bring, you know, like, let's say 20 years of, of thinking uh, about, you know, kind of 20 years of, of, of aesthetic development, 20 years of conceptual development, 20 years of kind of like, let's say, formal development uh, into the space of what I would describe as NFTs and world making, um, simultaneously acknowledging that um, you know, artists who've been, let's say, been working within the contemporary art world digitally for for decades. You know, we've 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 met, we've we're we're here. You know, we're we're speaking. We're we're kind of um, 
were present. But uh, weirdly, the contemporary art was getting more conservative, not less conservative. It's becoming more analog. It's becoming more geographic. It's becoming less open to like experimentation, you know? And there's this kind of weird sort of stultifying into a kind of like, let's say kind of late conceptualism meets art povera, let's just say. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, my, my, my role or my kind of presence in that world just kind of was sort of shrinking. You know, I'd sort of go to you know, different kind of settings, like even Biennales, frankly. And I was like, you know, this, this could have happened like 50 years ago, this Biennale. I mean, and there's some Biennales mm -hmm. running right now, which could have happened 50 years ago. Like, they're running this summer. You know, it's, mm -hmm. like, it's, it's kind of amazing how, I would say, how kind of conservative in medium terms a lot of the contemporary art Biennales are right now. Got it. So, you know, out of nowhere, for me anyway, you know, this NFT space like spun into view, you know, which kind of delivers two things simultaneously. Like it delivers a radical distribution model because, you know, it's not like geographic analog, come here, buy this, leave again, put it in a crate. Uh, it's kind of digital people collecting digital things, you know, and passionately connecting digital things, you know, and it's early days of that. So, uh, you know, it's 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 a kind of distribution model, um, and it's also like an exhibition space. You know, where like like who was really looking at web art like three years ago? You know, like it was very niche. You know, um, you know, I certainly wasn't like making work for the web. You know, I was making work for the world. You know, but the world is now looking at and like somehow that weird kind of triangular relationship between kind of art money and society which is kind of like a whole thing in itself you know which is kind of mm -hmm. the eternal kind of like uh, kind of conflict of you know like there's an internal conflict within that and the painting's been in the midst of it forever but suddenly within that nexus of art money and, and society uh you know, people are paying attention to websites showing digital art and it's it's just like night and day in terms of how digital artists can work you know, and how they can survive and how they can thrive and how they can speak and, you know, et cetera. Um, so uh, I would say that you know, there's a lot of problematics within the NFT space. There's a lot of opportunities. But for me, it is the absolute core focus for me right now. And again, to reiterate, you know, to bring like just many, many years of, of thought and development within simulation on the one hand, but also within exhibition on the other, you know, and to bring them, you know, and try and bring them into that space and to, you know, talk to the wider communities there. And, you know, even, even, you know, like when I first looked into NFTs, like a year and a half ago, you know, mm -hmm. it was a very two dimensional space, very linear two dimensional space, you know, and people and such things, the emergence of like art blocks, you know, kind of threw up this, this generative element, which is kind of code based and, you know, fundamentally artistic in a way that other parts of the NFT world kind of less so. And I, I really feel that like there's just this incredibly exciting possibility to think about space and time in that space next, you know, so that's what I'm going to do. Well, John, I, I really appreciate your time today. And I really, it's really been a joy talking to you about, about your work that's uh, so thoughtful and, um, and is, uh, I just feel is, you know, taking advantage of the changing technological landscape, but also is just kind of challenging people to to think about the world around them and these structures of uh, of power, right? And so, I really appreciate your time today. Oh, it's a pleasure, and thanks for having me on. That's all the time we have for this week. You've been listening to Art Sense. You can find the show on Apple Podcasts, iTunes. Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. If you've enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe. And while you're there, please rate the show and leave a quick review. Your feedback is the key to other folks finding us. And if you'd like to see images related to the conversation, read the transcript, and find other bonus features, you can go to cambia.art and click on the podcast tab. 
If you'd like to reach out to me, you can email me at craig at cambia.art. Thanks for listening.